so today I'm going to be talking to you about balancing brain and lung protection in the NICU using transcutaneous CO2 monitoring. Um, I'm going to be talking about the importance of monitoring CO2, especially continuously in the NICU. Um, I'm going to be talking about getting AVGs and drawing too much blood, all the risk factors associated with that, especially with our NICU babies. And then finally, why transcutaneous is a good fit. So, you know, this is a webinar thing. You have to put your mug up on the uh, uh, website. And also, my, my wife did my headshot. I think she did a pretty good job. She took my face, put it through Photoshop, gave me a nose job, all that good stuff. So we could skip that part. Um, disclosures, just to re reiterate, uh, I am a clinical application specialist for Syntech. But in terms of this presentation, it's going to be specifically about the importance of monitoring CO2 continuously. And then I will be talking about transcutaneous in general with no mention of Syntech. So objectives. So you guys will be able to identify the percentage of NICU admissions that have some sort of respiratory component. Explain how CO2 levels can affect cerebral blood flow and incidence of IVH. And then finally, how transcutaneous can be used to balance both brain and lung protection of your neonate. So first, looking at the incidence of respiratory distress in our NICUs. So we're seeing anywhere from 21 to 47 percent incidence of respiratory distress. Uh, if you work in a level three, level four NICU, every time I go to a different hospital, I'm doing education for Syntec. Um, I always ask a number, and I feel like it's more than 21 to 40 percent. I feel like people are more like uh, 50 to 60, but also everyone's overworked and, and exhausted. So it definitely feels, feels like that at some time, at, at points. Uh, but you know, working in the NICU, there's multiple components, multiple reasons that could cause respiratory distress. Uh, so our preterm babies, underdeveloped lungs, not enough surfactant, there are higher likelihood of developing respiratory distress, uh, pneumonia, pneumothorax, pulmonary hemorrhage, uh, aspiration, and then our term babies, they have their own host of issues. So you have your meconium aspiration babies, transient tachypnea, PPH, and um, alveolar um, capillary dysplasia, dysplasia, surfactant protein deficiencies. So a ton of different disease processes in the NICU that cause respiratory distress. Being able to monitor their CO2, their ventilatory status is important. So looking at the incidence of respiratory stress across uh, gestational age, obviously the more premature they are, the more likelihood they're gonna have trouble breathing. So we're seeing our 28 weekers or less are having a 50% chance of respiratory distress, 30 to 31 weeks, 30% chance, and as they get closer to term, their lungs are more mature, more surfactant, they're doing, they're doing better. Uh, this bar graph is pretty interesting. It's looking at birth weight. Uh, so we're really seeing at that 1,500 gram cutoff, that's where we're seeing issues. So 1,500 grams or less, typically those are golden hour babies, 32, 33 weekers or less. Those are the ones that are having issues. So we're seeing when compared with other premature babies, length of stay is increasing from 14 days to 43 days, and cost of stay is increasing from 21K to 77K. So pretty substantial. Um, it's also important to note that 12% of babies that are born in the United States are born prematurely. That's a higher rate than any other developed country. So here in the United States, we are resuscitating 22, 23, 24-week babies. Uh, they have a ton of complications, and being able to correctly monitor them, diagnose them, to, uh, is important to correctly treat them. So we all know about CO2 in the brain. Um, if your patient's CO2 increases, your cerebral blood flow increases. CO2 decreases, your cerebral blood flow is going to decrease. But we're seeing multiple studies show that increase, prolonged period of high CO2, sharp fluctuations in CO2, and prolonged periods of low CO2, all three of these things are going to increase your incidence of IVH. Um, our babies, again, there's that 1,500 gram cutoff. Those are our... Um, golden hour babies is some, sometimes what they're uh, referred to. So 32, 33 weekers or less, they have a 25 to 42% incidence of developing IVH, and they're at their highest risk of developing IVH within the first three days of life. Um, so when you're in the NICU, you're, you're caring for your babies, and you're thinking about where is CO2 important, 
it's those babies less than 1,500 grams within the first three days of life. If you can try to normalize that CO2, try to stabilize that CO2, hopefully you can control that cerebral, cerebral blood flow and hopefully reduce IVH rate. So just to take a step back through a review of what IVH is, so intraventricular hemorrhage, it's when the baby has bleeding into the fluid area, fluid filled areas of the brains or the ventricles. So you have two images to your right. You have normal ventricles, and then you have an image of a grade two um, IVH. And again, this is gonna be more common in premature babies that are your high acuity babies that are, have um, blood pressure issues, saturation issues, heart rate issues. Um, also, there's four stages, uh, one through four, one and two being your least severe, three and four being your most severe. Uh, recently, UAB just came out with an IVH reduction uh, study. So they were, for their babies that were less than 29 weeks, they were monitoring CO2 continuously for the first week of life. They were also monitoring a bunch of other things because we all know IVH is multifactorial. Um, but one of the big things being, you know, CO2 and cerebral blood flow, they were able to reduce IVH in their NICU from 20% to down to 10%. So pretty substantial and it was a great use of using continuous CO2. Uh, we also have periventricular leukomalacia. So this is something that we hear a little less about. So this is when your baby has a prolonged period of low CO2. And typically when we see this, this is after surfactant administration, you give that surfactant, their lung compliance improves, improves but you're leaving them on the same ventilatory settings. Um, and you may not get a blood gas for an hour or two later, you get that blood gas result and you see that your CO2 has dropped and that baby had a prolonged period of low CO2. And so that's where you're kind of seeing these incidents of, of PVL. So what periventricular leukomalacia is, it's where the white matter around the ventricles, dies, creates holes or cysts in the brain. Uh, a couple images to your right, so you have a mild form of PVL and then you have a more severe cystic form of PVL where the brain actually develops cysts. Um, it, again, this is gonna be more common in those babies that are less than 32 weeks, less than 1,500 grams. In those babies that are unstable, uh, blood pressure that's unstable, frequent heart rate drops, um, desaturations, and then also more common in babies have also experienced an IVH. Uh, a good you know, clinical practice here, uh, anytime that you are doing surfactant administration, it's a good idea to monitor CO2. So you can, you know, it's one, it's cool to see that compliance improve and see those pressures reduce on your ventilator if you're in, if you're in PRVC. Um, but it's also interesting to see your ventilation improve, see your CO2 come down you're able to wean that ventilator quicker, and we all know that's best for the baby's lung. And that leads us to this slide. So this is, as RTs, we know this relationship very well, CO2 in the lungs. Um, with our babies who are mechanically ventilated, if we can optimize our ventilator settings um, to try to decrease our plateau pressures, um, but keep our CO2 in a manageable range, that's ideal. Uh, when I was at St. Louis Children's Hospital, we had uh, an initiative to reduce BPD rates, and we were following a study that came out somewhat recently, about three years ago, that showed that reducing or um, excavating within the first 48 to 72 hours has been shown to reduce BPD rates in the NICU. So that became part of our initiative to reduce BPD. Um, and so we were weaning ventilators a lot quicker uh, we would use uh, continuous CO2 monitoring, transcutaneous CO2 monitoring as a tool to help us wean those ventilators quicker, optimize those vent settings, and then try to extubate those patients within the first 48 to 72 hours. And after we would extubate them, we would typically put them on non-invasive through the ventilator, leave that CO2 monitor on, make sure that they were gonna fly extubation and optimize those non-invasive settings. Because we, we all know here that if we could reduce ventilator days, we can reduce chronic lung disease, we could reduce BPD. So we want to avoid the, that peaking of our pressure volume loop that's telling us that our lungs are hyperinflated. Um, and we also want to make sure that we ventilate our patient appropriately. We're giving enough of a pressure, enough of a peep. 
Uh, so we're shooting for that safe window. And so what kind of helps us balance these two ideas is continuous CO2 monitoring. We can consider what we're doing to that cerebral blood flow, try to reduce IVH incidence of PVLs, and then also consider what we're doing to our patient's lungs, try to prevent against chronic lung disease. So continuous CO2 monitoring helps us employ those strategies, like permissive hypercapnia. You're allowing your CO2 maybe to get up into the high 50s if it means keeping your plateau pressures below 30. It helps a lot, a lot more with those types of strategies. So let, let's take a step back and talk about the gold standard of assessing ventilation, and that's getting a blood gas, so doing an ABG. Uh, but blood draws are associated with multiple risk factors. So of course you have blood loss, you have pain and stimulation, you have infection risk, and then you have time loss. So we'll get into each one of these. Maybe. There we go. So first, how much blood is being drawn? So this study showed that within the first six weeks of life, up to 30% of the circulating blood volume is drawn for lab work each week. And to put that in perspective, six to seven mils of blood being drawn from an infant weighing one kilo is equivalent to 450 mils of blood being drawn from an adult. So if you think about drawing one or two mils of blood from your neonate, and you're like, yeah, that's, that's not too, too much blood, but if you do that multiple times throughout the day, that's a, a good percentage of their circulating blood volume, and you kind of see that, and it's good to compare with the adults. You know, 450 mils of blood being drawn, I, I wouldn't want that. That makes me lightheaded thinking about it. So pretty substantial. Um, what is the blood being drawn for? So this is an analysis of 50 very low birth weight infants. Uh, this is the cumulative number of laboratory tests um, throughout a week. And so out of 140 tests, 57 of the tests were for pH or blood gases. So pH and blood gases being the main driver of blood loss in the NICU. So if you could reduce that, you could reduce blood loss. Also is all that blood being used. So this is a study looking at 14 uh, very low birth weight babies within the first 28 days of life. And then here we're seeing that we're drawing way too much blood. We're drawing way too much blood that it, than what is required for those instruments. So in this study, they found that up to 63% of the blood that is being drawn is wasted. And then why does it matter? So there's a direct relationship between the blood that we are taking out of our patients and then the blood that we have to, be, we have to put back in. So, um, here we can see that phlebotomy is well established as the main cause of anemia of prematurity. Um, if we are drawing blood, we're reducing our baby's red blood cell accounts, we're causing anemia. That's going to cause the clinicians to transfuse these babies. Uh, and transfusions come with their own host of risk factors. So transfusions may as much as double the risk of your patient developing necrotizing intercolitis. 30% uh, of neck cases are transfusion related. Um, and if your baby does have a transfusion associated necrotizing and colitis, it increases their morbidity and their mortality. Um, and then transfusions, they come with their own host of risk factors. So you have lung injury, uh, you have infection, uh, you have transfusion reactions. And if you have a baby who is at risk of developing an IVH, and you're transfusing that baby, and you're increasing their overall circulating volume pretty drastically, you may increase that risk of that baby developing IVH. Or if they have a grade one or two IVH, you transfuse that baby, you can increase that um, IVH to a grade three or four. So how can we reduce blood loss in the NICU? So for our newborns, we can get our initial blood draws from our umbilical cord, our placental blood, and you can delay that cord toward clamping. Um, also, if you give supplemental iron, you're less likely to have to transfuse. Uh, adhering to stri strict transfusion protocols and only drawing the amount that's required for that instrument. Um, using bedside point of care, typically uh, those require lower volumes. They also do several different analysis from a single sample of blood. Uh, implementing transcutaneous technology. So if ABGs are the main driver of blood loss in the NICU, if you're gonna monitor your patient's ventilatory status non-invasively, you're gonna reduce blood loss. 
Um, and then also be that patient's advocate, educate caregivers about the importance of reducing blood loss in the NICU. So Councilman, he had a paper and he just summarized that paper by saying, if you can just decrease the amount of phlebotomy loss in the NICU, it's probably the easiest area of neonatology that could be changed the quickest, just by paying attention to how much blood that you are drawing and only draw the amount that's needed for that instrument. And then also using uh, non-invasive um, monitoring to reduce um, blood loss. Um, pain is another risk factor associated with drawing blood. So here we have four different studies. They had different criteria of what they considered pain and stimulation. Uh, but what these studies found is our babies, our NICU babies are experienced anywhere from eight to 17 painful procedures per day. So pretty significant. Um, and what painful procedure is most, most common? So 61 to 87% of invasive procedures are keel sticks. Um, rarely do you give local anesthetic when you're doing heel sticks, and if you do, uh, it's been shown that they're not very effective. And then what are the con consequences? So we know working in the NICU, how many people in attendance do work in like a level, work in the NICU currently? Good, so we, we have a few. Um, so we know, you know, when you go into the NICU and you listen with a stethoscope, they don't like the stimulation, they clamp down, you'll see their heart rate drop, you'll see sometimes their saturations will drop, sometimes you get fluctuations in their blood pressure. They don't tolerate it very well, they don't have the neural development to be able to comfort themselves, they don't understand what's going on. And it's been shown that pain that is experienced within the first few days of life has tend to magnify that pain later on in life. And then, pain has negative consequences for neurological outcomes. So I'm sure you've all heard about this. That's why touch times are a thing in the NICU. Um, and so here, just to kind of go over that, it's kind of a busy slide, uh, but here we have six different studies that are looking at um, exposures to pain and then what it means for that neonatal baby's brain microstructure and what it means for their neurological outcomes. So this first study looked at around 150 neonates around gestational age, around 28 weeks gestation. Um, and they assessed their brain microstructure at 40 weeks. And so they found that early skin breaks were associated with a reduction in their thalamus. And they also saw a reduction in, in that white matter microstructure. They had these same babies come in at, um, oh, well, they weren't babies anymore. They came in at three years of age, did a neurological um, consult and they found that cognitive and motor scores were predicted by that thalamic growth. So the reduction in that thalamus due to an increased exposure to pain resulted in decreased cognitive and motor scores. Another study looked at the Bailey MBI scores of eight months old and 18 month olds. So they took the babies that had a high number of skin breaks and assessed their Bailey MBI scores at eight months and 18 months, and the higher number of skin breaks uh, predicted a lower Bailey MDI score. And then moving on to school age, they found that in seven-year-olds, a uh, greater number of invasive procedures experienced as a neonate resulted in a reduction in white matter and a reduction in IQ scores. And they also found that um, cumulative experiences of pain in the NICU were a result of changes in brain activity, which were negatively correlated with visual and perceptual abilities at school age. So not only is it affecting their, their cognitive ability, they're not, not only affecting IQ scores, it's also affecting visual and perceptual abilities. And then finally, uh, this last study looked at eight-year-olds, and they found that more neonatal invasive procedures resulted in a smaller thalamus and amygdala. So again, your thalamus is that area of the brain that sends uh, motor uh, sensor, sensory signals to your brain's cortex. And so a reduction in that thalamus uh, resulted in poor cognitive and visual motor skills. And then a re reduction in that amygdala, your amygdala is that area of the brain that processes emotion. Um, a smaller amygdala resulted in adverse behavior outcomes. So Six different studies here, kind of a busy slide, 
uh, but you're seeing that early exposures to pain, um, more pain that is experienced by a neonate uh, is a result, is resulting in decreased neurological outcomes. So how can we reduce pain in the NICU? So uh, decreasing bedside disruption. So this goes back to the touch times, which that's, that's hard for us to comply with uh, being an RT. Uh, you're trying, you have 10, 12 different patients, the nurse has one or two. Um, so that's when I always recommend trying to prioritize uh, your high acuity patients. So those babies who are at high risk of developing brain bleeds, uh, those babies are at a high risk of developing uh, chronic lung disease and having those adverse effects of pain. Those are your babies that you want to adhere to touch times. So you typically you have you know two or three high acuity babies. Those are your babies that you want to adhere to touch times. Um, also, anticipate laboratory testing to minim minimize the frequency of blood sampling. So you're poking that baby less, and if you're using those point of care mis machines, not only do they require less blood, but they do several different analysis. So you, hopefully that means you're reducing the amount that you have to poke that baby. Um, if you're the one doing heel six, or if you, know, you work in a NICU where the uh, nurses are doing the heel six, you notice that you're either doing three to four heel six per day, or you're noticing the nursing is doing three to four heel six per day. That's a lot of pain for that baby. So being that patient's advocate and uh, going to the care team and asking them to put in a central line. If you're getting that much blood, a central line is probably appropriate for that baby. And then also non-invasive monitoring. Any non-invasive monitoring is gonna help reduce the amount of lab labs that you are getting. So again, transcutaneous monitoring, um, SVO2, glucose, bilirubin, NIRAS, all these things. And then it's also important just to continue um, those comfort care, uh, kangaroo care with mom, um, all these comfort things without actually have to providing uh, medication for these babies is important. Uh, McPherson, he had a paper that was uh, summarized by saying everyday clinical exposures are key predictors of brain maturation and the pain being one such everyday clinical exposure and how there's more and more increased evidence that show that pain is a key factor in brain dismaturation. Uh, another risk factor associated with drawing blood is infection. So here we could see that you have all the different hospital acquired infections. You have bloodstream infections, uh, lower respiratory infections, urinary tract infections, sur surgical site infections. And so our babies, uh, so our uh, neonatal group, so less than a month, a month to a year, we're seeing that bloodstream infections are the most common type of hospital acquired infection. And how do infections impact outcomes? So we're doing a lot of heel sticks. Heel sticks can cause cellulitis, pericondylitis, osteomyelitis, and abscesses. Um, you have to remember each time you're, you're drawing from that central line, you're increasing the risk of contamination and that leads us to potential collapsy. So every NICU is monitoring collapses, and this is one big reason why they're monitoring collapses, because it's increasing the mean length of stay up to 21 days, which is pretty substantial. And then also collapses are the most common cause of late onset sepsis in our NICU babies, and sepsis is the leading cause of both morbidity and mortality in this age group. So how to reduce infection. So, uh, continued education about the importance of hand hygiene. That's, you know, scrubbing in before you're going into the NICU. Uh, foaming in and out of, in, of rooms, wearing nothing below the elbows, no sleeves, no watches, no rings. Uh, completely sterile technique when they're doing tube changes. And a lot of these are probably more respiratory or more uh, RN focused. So scrubbing the hub with chlorhexidine for 10 to 15 seconds standardizing dressing changes, standardizing um, central line tube insertions, and then talking about it during rounds. What's not included in reducing infection, if again, if you're drawing less blood, if you're using non-invasive monitoring, you're gonna draw less blood, you're gonna reduce infection. So in summary, uh, what does a blood co draw cost? So you're, of course you have anemia if you're drawing a lot of blood, ABGs being the 
main driver of blood loss in the NICU. Uh, you're reducing the red blood cell count of that baby. You're causing anemia. Clinicians are then going to want to transfuse. Transfusions have been shown to double the risk of your patient developing necrotizing enterocolitis. And then you may also increase the risk of your baby developing an IVH or increasing that grade one or two IVH to a grade three or four. Also, you worry about pain and stimulation. So going back to those six studies that showed early exposures to pain, reduced um, Bailey and BI scores, you had a reduction in IQ scores, you saw a change in brain microstructure that showed uh, overall decrease in neurological outcomes. And then you have infection risk. So if you're drawing from that central line, you're increasing the likelihood of your baby developing sepsis. Sepsis is bad news in the NICU. Uh, it's increase in both morbidity and mortality in the NICU and length of stay. And then also you have time loss. So this is what we're gonna talk about next. Um, it's the amount of time that it takes you to respond to a change in your patient's ventilatory status. If we're relying on ABGs, ABGs are a point in time measurement. If we're continuously monitoring CO2, we will respond to changes a lot quicker. So first let's take a look at the incidence of abnormal CO2 values in the NICU. Uh, two different thresholds here. So as the Van Cam Kugelman study, Van Cam's threshold was CO2 greater than 52. And for hypocarbia, CO2 less than 30. Uh, Kugelman's was CO2 greater than 60 and CO2 less than 30 for hypocarbia. So we're seeing anywhere from a 17 to 31% likelihood of hypercarbia in our NICU and anywhere from a three to 4% likelihood of hypocarbia. And one thing to remember about blood gases and here's kind of to prove my point about how they are a point in time measurement. Um, this is an overnight trend of an adult patient. I know this is a NICU presentation, but in terms of just proving this point, um, three out of the four blood gases here are within the normal range. And then you could see there in the six o'clock hour, the blood gas that was taken, the patient's CO2 got up into the 60s. So you think about what you would do as a clinician with uh, these blood gases. You would intervene at hour six. You would place this patient on CPAP, BiPAP. If they're already on CPAP, BiPAP, this patient may need to be intubated. Um, but whatever you decide to do, you may intervene and correct that CO2. But here's the transcutaneous CO2 reading of that patient. And you think about what you would have done differently as a clinician. You could see that this patient within the first hour had a CO2 that was above 60. And for most of the time, this patient was hypercarbic. Um, and you would change, totally change your, your plan of care. You would intervene a lot quicker than if you were going off blood gases. Uh, this is the two hour trend of a neonatal patient. Uh, they got a gas at the one o'clock hour. The gas was somewhere in the low 40s. And here was their transcutaneous reading. So it told, again, told a different story. Uh, within that first hour, maybe the baby was upset. They went up into the 60s, but then they corrected themselves, came back down. Uh, they got a blood gas. And then 30 minutes after that blood gas, that baby CO2 went up into the 60s and stayed there. Um, and so again, this just goes back to the point, intervening quicker, what you would do differently as a clinician. Um, and you would think this baby, if you were just going off ABGs, you're gonna wait for other signs of um, not being able to ventilate appropriately. Maybe you're gonna wait to intervene until you see this baby start pulling, retracting. You see a change in your oxygen saturations. But if you have continuous CO2 monitoring, you'll be able to intervene, get ahead of them a lot quicker. Uh, this is a really good study, this looking at outcomes associated with between um, monitoring CO2 continuously and not monitoring CO2 continuously. So in this study, you have two clinician groups. You have um, a blinded group. They are blinded to that CO2 reading, and then you have a monitor group where they could see that CO2 reading, make changes based off that reading. So in the blinded group, 17.7% of the time, their patients spent with the CO2 either above 60 or below 30. And then in the monitor group, only 7.6% of the time did their patients spend with the CO2 outside those safe ranges. And then this is what it meant for their patient outcomes. So 43% of the babies that were in the blinded group where they were not monitoring CO2 continuously had an incidence of IVH or PVLs. And then in the monitor group, only 12% of their babies had an incidence of IVH and PVLs. So 
Um, I know IVH is multifactorial. You want to consider what you're doing with your fluid status, um, touch times, sedation, transfusions, all these other things. But this study just highlighting the importance and what transcutaneous or what continuous CO2 can do for you as, as um, looking at IVH and reducing IVH rates. Uh, this is just another uh, graph of the same study, just showing um, the amount of time the patients that, who are in the blinded group spent with CO2 outside those safe ranges, and then again, the results. So we know monitoring CO2 uh, continuously is important. There's two different ways to do this. Uh, we have transcutaneous CO2 and we have end tidal. So we love our end tidal for intubation. It tells us whether or not we are in the trachea or we are in the esophagus. Um, you get a nice breath-to-breath -breath waveform, so if that tube gets dislodged, you immediately know. Um, Entitle is great for those things. Uh, but when it comes to Entitle and the NICU, you do have some issues. It's um, close to being infeasible to use. Uh, you, we use a lot of uncuffed ET tubes in the NICU. You have patients with tidal volumes that are less than 10 mils. You have respiratory rates as high as 60, 70 uh, breaths per minute. You're not getting a good exhaled CO2 sample, you're not getting a good entital sample, and it's gonna underestimate what the patient's actual blood CO2 is. Um, also, you can't use entital with non-invasive modes, you can't use it with high frequency. Those are two modes of ventilation that you're gonna prioritize in your NICU to protect the lung. Um, you worry about dead space as well, so if you're putting an uh, entital adapter into the circuit of a patient who has a tidal volume of 10 and it's causing a one mil of dead space, that's 10% that's of their tidal volume, so it's a lot of dead space. Uh, and then you're adding weight to that ET tube as well. Uh, transcutaneous CO2 technology is another way of measuring CO2 continuously. Because it's a sensor that is placed on the skin, it's measuring CO2 diffusing through the skin. It can be used with any type of ventilation. So high frequency, non-invasive, mechanical ventilation. Uh, you could put it on your spontaneously breathing patients. You don't have to worry about dead space, weight on the end of the ET tube. Um, it's gonna be accurate despite VQ mismatch. So if your baby has a unilateral pneumonia, has a VQ mismatch, uh, it's gonna be more accurate than end tidal in that baby. Um, and then it's gonna be accurate despite the size of the tidal volume and respiratory rate. Some of the drawbacks with transcutaneous. So you don't have a breath-to-breath -breath waveform. So you're not gonna be using transcutaneous for intubation assessment, whether or not that tube's in the right place. Um, you need a good uh, perfusion at the monitoring site uh, to get a good reading. And it does require calibration at least every eight hours. So these are some of the frustrations, some of the challenges in the NICU. Um, if you don't have that ability to monitor CO2 continuously and accurately. So um, your clinician group may want you to monitor CO2 continuously or frequently to prevent against IVH, but also at the same time, you're trying not to draw too much blood on those patients. Uh, they want you to limit mechanical ventilation days, um, but don't wean until they're ready to avoid reintubation because all the risk factors associated with reintubation. Uh, make sure that the CO2 doesn't get too low to prevent against uh, periventricular leukomalacia that we talked about earlier, but also don't underinflate the lungs and cause adelect trauma. Uh, make sure that the CO2 doesn't get too high, cause a ins higher incidence of IVH, uh, but don't over distend the lungs, cause volume trauma or barrel trauma. Monitor CO2 continuously, but at the same time, they want you to prioritize non-invasive and high-frequency ventilation methods, which are a lot more um, gentle on the patient's lungs. And then keep a close eye on them, but also let them be. So what helps you with all these back and forths um, is transcutaneous technology, having a continuous monitoring of your patient's ventilatory status. You can keep a close eye on them, but also let them be. And we kind of heard this during the COVID pandemic when People were using transcutaneous technology in the PICU and the adult world where those patients were a lot, lot more sick and they were trying to limit their exposure, the amount that they were going into the room. I was, I've been told multiple times it's great 
to have that CO2 reading along with our other vital signs up on the screen uh, to assess whether or not I need to go and expose myself to a patient. So same thing goes for the NICU and it goes for your touch times. Being able to monitor that patient outside the room and not going in and uh, assessing them and bothering that patient. Oh, skipped ahead there. Let's go back. I'm all over the place. All right, so here is newer transcutaneous technology and how it works. So you have a sensor. Uh, this is an illustration of the sensor. Inside that sensor, you have a severing house electrode. You have microprocessors. You have temperature thermistors to keep that sensor at a specific temperature. And so how it's gonna work, it's gonna gently warm the skin, increase perfusion at the side of the sensor. CO2 is gonna diffuse through the skin by the process of metabolism. And then it's gonna interact with the um, electrolyte. I don't know if this has a pointer. Uh, so there's an electrolyte solution that's in between the membrane and the sensor. And this is pretty important to how the technology works. So if you work with transcutaneous, doing a correct membrane change on that sensor is very important because when the CO2 diffuses through the skin, interacts with that electrolyte solution, it's actually going to reduce the pH of that electrolyte solution. The sensor is gonna monitor that change in pH and place that into algor algorithms that give you an estimated PaCO2. So three takeaways from this slide is if you're working with transcutaneous technology is make sure you're doing good, act, good membrane changes the appropriate way. Uh, make sure you have good perfusion and good adhesion to the skin. Um, if you have any added pressure on the sensor, so if the baby lays on it or they have a bumper going around them that's pressing up against the sensor, that's gonna push perfusion away. CO2 is still gonna be diffusing through the skin, so that'll give you a falsely high CO2 reading. And then if you lose adhesion to the skin, so you wanna make sure that ring that that sensor is sitting in is sticking. If it's reading any ambient air, that's gonna give you a falsely low CO2 reading. So you need good perfusion, good adhesion to the skin, and then good maintenance of that sensor. Um, Accuracy is important with transcutaneous, and so we have three different studies with three different patient populations to show that uh, transcutaneous is matching up very well with our patient's blood CO2. Um, if transcutaneous is not accurate, then you don't use it. You don't think it's reliable, you don't trust it. It stays in a closet and collects dust. So here are three different studies. The first one, um, critically ill children, children with a median age of two years, uh, two years old, they had an R value of 0.7, and so there was good agreement between the transcutaneous value and the patient's PaCO2. Um, and then we also had NICU patients, gestation, gestational age, 25 weeks. 64% uh, of these babies were on vasopressors, so potentially perfusion issues in these babies, uh, and they were on high-frequency ventilation. So we saw an R square value in these babies of 0.8, so you had good agreement between the, between the transcutaneous reading and the patient's PaCO2. And then finally, we have uh, mechanically ventilated infants, 27 weeks to term, and again, we saw good agreement between the transcutaneous reading and the patient's blood gas CO2 with an R-square value of 0.71. And this is, so if transcutaneous is accurate, it should help you reduce blood draws in the NICU. And that's exactly what Children's Hospital of Philadelphia did. Uh, once they introduced that technology, they got used to using the technology. They learned how to use it. They had confidence in their number. They wanted to see if it was actually helping them reduce the amount of blood draws that they were doing in the NICU. So what they found was a greater than 25% reduction in blood draw blood draws per day on their mechanically ventilated patients. So for their patients on high frequency ventilation, they reduced blood draws by two, and their patients that who are on mechanical ventilation, they reduced blood draws by one per day. So pretty significant. Uh, safety and skin integrity. So this is always a topic of conversation with uh, transcutaneous technology because uh, older transcutaneous technology worked at much higher temperatures. Uh, they use older technology, uh, analog technology that had to send that information back to the monitor to give you a reading. 
Um, so here we could see a couple tests, 50 patients, uh, birth weight 740 to 1300 grams, gestational age 25 to 30 weeks, and they actually left that sensor on for longer than what we would recommend. We recommend eight hours, but still they had no detectable harm to the patient's skin. Uh, another study, 15 patients, a little over a kilo, uh, gestational age 27 to 40 weeks. They left the sensor on for 21 median hours, and there was no detectable harm to the patient's skin. So newer technology is working at 41 degrees Celsius. It's recommended to calibrate that sensor every eight hours, so you're taking that sensor off the patient's skin. Um, and always, you know, I always recommend assessing that skin because every neonate's different. Those little 350 grammers, they are, they're gonna have some sensitive skin. So if you need to move that sensor site, uh, make sure you do that. Uh, monitoring sites for that sensor. So depending on how you, I've been to a couple NICUs that do more side to side. I've been, most NICUs do prone and supine. Uh, so depending on what you do, that's where you wanna place your sensor. You want to place that in an area where the baby's not gonna end up laying on it and you're not having to take that ring on and off a lot. So if you're doing pro prone or supine, which most NICUs do, uh, I recommend the flank or the side of the chest is a good spot to put that sensor. Uh, the forehead is probably the most underutilized spot because of the way it looks, but you have great perfusion at the forehead. You get good correlation with the gases. Um, it's an easy explanation to the parents you know, you say this sensor is gonna allow us to monitor your, your patient's breathing, your baby's breathing a lot closer, maybe help us wean our ventilator a little bit faster. They're gonna be okay with that sensor on the forehead. Um, and then you have the thighs. So inner outer thighs are a good area. With the thighs, you wanna make sure that you have good perfusion. If you have a baby that has low blood pressure or they're on vasoactive drugs, their thighs seem cold or mottled, stick towards the core, stick to, towards the forehead. So principles of correlation, some of these, some of these things are already mentioned. So um, site, that, that's just referring to perfusion. Make sure you have good perfusion. Um, also, if your baby has, if it's a newborn with a gigantic PDA, you're seeing a large gradient between your pre and post ductal saturations. Uh, depending on where you're drawing that blood, I, that's where I would recommend having that sensor. So if you're drawing that blood from post ductal blood or pre ductal blood, uh, you want to have that sensor either on a pre or post ductal site. So, if you're getting a UVC, which would be pre ductal blood, I would recommend having that sensor on the pre ductal site. So, either on the right clavicle or the forehead. If you're doing a heel stick, that'll be post ductal blood. So, having that sensor either on the left side or on the thighs would be post ductal. Um, seal, you want to make sure, again, that that ring is adhered to the patient. There's no ambient air in between the sensor and the patient. That will give you a falsely low CO2 reading. Uh, make sure you have good, the patient status. Uh, consider uh, what's going on with the patient. If they don't have good perfusion, stick that sensor near the core on the forehead. And then always look at the integrity of the, the sensor. You know, it's, we're infamous for being rough with our equipment because we're, we're in such a hurry and, you know, we're, we're busy. Uh, so sometimes those sensors can be compromised the, the membrane can be compromised. Always look at that sensor. All right, so in summary, CO2 is an important parameter in protecting both the brain and the lung of the NICU. It's gonna help us hopefully reduce IVH rates for monitoring continuously. Um, it's gonna help us optimize our ventilator settings. And then um, we, we've seen that high, low, large fluctuations of CO2 have caused increases in IVH. Um, ABGs are just a point in time measurement. They might not tell the entire story of what's going on with your patient. If you're measuring with CO2 continuously, you are going to lessen the time that that patient spends outside those safe CO2 ranges and hopefully lessen those outcomes and lessen those incidents of IVH. Um, in title is pretty much infeasible to use in the NICU because of uncuffed ET tubes the size of the tidal volume, the, the respiratory rate, um, dead space that you're putting on the end of that ET tube. Um, great for intubation, great for that breath-to-breath -breath waveform, but it has its limitations. It's underestimating what the patient's actual blood CO2 is. So in 
in summary, modern transcutaneous technology overcomes limits of previous devices to offer accurate, continuous, non-invasive CO2 values regardless of ventilation method or VQ mismatch, all the while supporting neuroprotective efforts to deliver clustered care, protect skin integrity, and reduce the frequency of blood draws. All right, thank you guys. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Pretty straightforward. Mon mon monitoring CO2, monitoring ventilation, it's important. Um, you know, you think about in the NICU, or in the PICU, and in the adult ICU, you're monitoring CO2 continuously with end tidal. Um, you know, why wouldn't you monitor CO2 continuously in the NICU when those babies are at higher risk of chronic lung disease and IVH? So that, that, that's the big takeaway. And uh, if you have any other questions, you don't want to raise your hand right now and talk in front of a big group. I get it. You know, I don't necessarily love this. So uh, if you find me outside uh, or in the vendor hall, you want to ask me questions, come find me. All right, thank you guys. Thanks.